is there a way we can get over the things that people have done to us? That's what we'll talk about today. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. Martin Luther King Jr. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness and what God expects of us and what helps us get over things. Should we get over things? Should we remember things? What does forgiveness really mean? And we're going to do so in the frame of the book, Total Forgiveness. When everything in you wants to hold a grudge, point a finger, and remember the pain, God wants you to lay it all aside by R.T. Kendall. The book talks about the biblical experience of forgiveness. That's the stage, right? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. King James Version. That's Matthew 5, 48. Or, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's King James Version 2, Matthew 6, 15. Someone even brought up the point that in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do we forgive people who sin against us? We better check ourselves because maybe we want Jesus to forgive ourselves more than we forgive others who sin against us. But this book about forgiveness is trying to get us down that right path. The introduction to the book is written by Professor Washington A.J. Okumu, and he's from Kenya, and he's the guy who helped negotiate kind of the lasting peace in South Africa. And he did so with the message of forgiveness. What do you do when you have two groups of people find it very hard to forgive each other? And how can we now get past that and come to some sort of a stand with each other, not have civil war, but instead find peace? And through this forgiveness, that is how he worked through all of those things. You know, he got mad at certain points by things people said, and he realized that he had to forgive as well as the mediator of the forgiveness. So his comments about this book are important because he is the guy who had to forgive a lot and had to help other people forgive a lot too. So RT had a professor in college who sort of, you ever met one of those people who just seems to know you, knows The inner soul of you kind of understands what you're made of. This Joseph Tassone was a college professor at Westminster Chapel and said to him, until you totally forgive them, you will be in chains. Release them and you will be released. Or I always heard it this way, that anger and bitterness is the poison you want to feed someone else, but you drink yourself. This is a huge problem for all of us. And we live in a world right now that is a grudge society. We want to hold grudges against people. We want to know how angry it is. We also want everyone else to know how angry we are too. Someone brought up a really interesting point about why so many couples in Hollywood were getting back together after getting divorced or breaking up. And they said it was because those people didn't drag them through the mud after their first breakup. And they realized this is a person I can trust. We live in a world of vengeance, but in Romans 12, 19, God says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord, King James Version again. Again, I try to stick to English Standard Version, but when the book itself quotes a certain version, I tend to stick with that too. And so that is really the point, is that God is the person who is the forgiver, the ultimate forgiver, and we should walk in his way, that we should show compassion to one another because God showed us compassion. And so we have to walk in the path of Jesus, and this is one of those ways. And he says, quote, I am convinced this theme of total forgiveness is perhaps more crucially needed at this present moment than nearly any other teaching in the Bible. He sees it. He sees it in the world that we are trying to drag each other around, we're trying to destroy each other, we can't forgive. This is a world where your sins, whether against a person or against society as some people see it, can never be forgiven. There is no forgiveness. There's only 
saying the right words and hoping people forget about you. But, you know, the next time you do something they don't like, they're going to bring it up again. There's no forgiveness at all. And he just says that in all of this, it's not worth it not to forgive other people. He says that there's kinds of forgiveness. There's a detached forgiveness, which means that it's reducing how mad I am at you. But there's no reconciliation, and I'm still, quite honestly, a little bit mad. Then there's limited forgiveness where, again, we don't get any sort of reconciliation, but we sort of partially say something to that person to indicate there's some forgiveness there. But at the end, there's full forgiveness. He says, quote, cessation of negative feelings towards the offender and the relationship is fully restored. And that's a big step. You see people in history, he mentions Corey Ten Boom, who forgave the man who abused her sister, murdered her sister, I believe, and during World War II. And that forgiveness makes Corey Ten Boom, if you've never read her books, The Hiding Place, I believe it is, it is just what, she's one of the most amazing people you'll ever read about. But her forgiveness of other people is amazing. And so in the end, he says that when we forgive people, it helps us more than it helps anyone else. So it's very hard to do it, sometimes particularly when the crime or the hurt is done to us or done to someone we love. But God asks us to do it. He asks us not to punish people, not to take revenge. He says that we should pray for our enemies, and our enemies would be someone who did bad things to us. And that when we do these things, it's to glorify God. He even mentions that in Acts 2, 14 through 41, the very people that brought judgment down on Jesus, ended his life, were the very same people Peter talked to on the day of Pentecost and were converted. God would rather see them back in the fold, back in the path to heaven, back in the love of God than for any sort of anger or vengeance to be taken on them. He says that even when we are to forgive people, he has this imaginary conversation with God. Do you mean that I should bless and prosper them, the person I'm trying to forgive? And that's where we have to do. Because God forgives us. He blesses us despite the things that we have done to him. So how is it that we couldn't do those very same thing to the people who harmed us. And that's what God wants in this world. He wants a world of reconciliation, of forgiveness, and not in a selfish way, but because it is what is given to us and it is what we should give to other people. And it is for our own psychological benefit if we do forgive people. He gives various quotes from Ephesians and Colossians, and like one of them in Colossians 3.13, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So you see it as this reciprocity. There's no getting around it because maybe we didn't do the thing that this person did. Like in Corey Ten Boom's place, her sister was murdered. Most of us don't murder other people. But when we sit against God, that forgiveness comes our way. That forgiveness comes. The, the person who ended her sister's life, he has forgiveness from God. And Corey realized that she has to give him forgiveness as well. And he says in the end that giving forgiveness does not mean that we close our eyes to what they did, that we'll let them hurt other people, that we'll erase from our memory what it is they did. We have to be able to still see exactly what it, that person is. But first of all, what that person is, is loved by God. He says some things that forgiveness is not. We're not approving of what they did. He mentions that in the Garden of Eden, the very first thing that God did was make clothes for Adam and Eve. It was an act of kindness. And that was the first sin, the first batch of sins. And God found a way not only to forgive them, but to be kind. And then when Jesus forgave the woman who was an adulteress, He didn't approve of what she did because at the end he says, go and sin no more. It's John 8, 11. So you're not forgetting what they did. You're not excusing it. You're not covering it up. You're just granting them mercy so that you can 
move on with your life and they can move on with theirs. You're not justifying what they did, pardoning what they did. Instead, this reconciliation is to bridge that forgiveness, to let them go, you know, let that anger and hatred go. He said that the person you're forgiving may not want to talk to you, may not want to see you, you may not want to have a relationship with them, but reconciliation does imply that if you're having a fight with a friend, a fight with a spouse, uh, something like that, reconciliation is an act of two people, not one people. So while you're going for forgiveness, if you can reconcile, that's another thing, but sometimes it's painful and it seems like not forgiving them or just denying there's a problem feels easier. Paul says that love keeps no records of wrong. And if we're truly loving each other, which is very hard when someone has done something quite horrible to you, how do you not keep a score? How do you not remember that? And so, again, you're trying to, he says, take our mental computer and erase it. Not what they did, because, again, you don't want to put yourself up into that situation where they're going to do it again, but you want to strike it down as being forgiven, done with, reconciled in your own heart. And then if you can't reconcile with the person themselves, that might not be what is possible at that moment. He says that you don't have to forgive and forget. That's just a phrase. That's not the Bible. But if we're forgetting what that person did, it's unrealistic. It might mean that we need some sort of counseling to forgive, but it also may be putting ourselves back in that danger again. You know, I've been in situations where my dad drove with my family and he was drunk and I stopped putting myself into that situation. Are there deep hurts there? Absolutely. Am I forgiving him as best I can? But if I could, would I get in the car with him when he was drunk? Absolutely not. So you also have to not forget things, not take what was done to you lightly, but instead you're going to want to make sure and, and not pretend like we're not hurt Our lives weren't threatened, but instead forgiving someone. He said that when we do forgive people, we're aware of what they did, the pain they caused, the maybe threat they gave to our lives, the harm they caused us, but we're not going to keep a record. We're not going to punish that person. We're not going to repay it. We're not seeking vindication. And we're not going to go around talking about what they did. But like in this situation, My dad was someone who drove drunk quite often, and a friend or a relative was going to get in the car with him when he was drinking or was planning on drinking. I would tell them that he has a history of drinking while driving, not out of vengeance, not out of gossip, but in order to protect them from what they may encounter. So again, this isn't about vengeance. This isn't about forgetting either. We want to keep the emotion, the hurt, the pain out. But again, this is about a battle with whether we're going to have the right emotion. If we tell someone, if we sue someone, it is because we're trying to protect other people. It is not because we're trying to gain vengeance, punishment, monetary benefits from it. We're going to forgive them for those reasons, but we will continue to protect ourselves and protect other people. And just as we go about forgiving, we have to think about what we want for our own sins against God. We know we won't be punished. We know God is not going to talk badly about us. And we know that the penalty that we're going to pay for our sins has been wiped clean. So that's the kind of forgiveness we should be giving other people. We're going to grant them mercy We're going to be gracious about it. He gives an interesting word study on the word forbearance or tolerance. And he says it's the exact opposite, quote, of being unduly rigorous. So we're not a prosecutor. We're not going to detail every crime like you were on a witness stand. Instead, we're going to be the opposite of that when we give other people grace. And he says, too, we have to forgive God. I think that was kind of an interesting point. 
I think in the end, sometimes we do feel anger or bitterness towards God, even though it's not God's fault or he didn't cause whatever thing to happen from us. But sometimes we think, how could this happen? How could whatever it is that happened to me happen? If God loves me, we have to remember that God turns evil into blessing. You know, that quote from Joseph where he says, you intended this for bad, not God, but to the people around him, but God intended it for good. Something that was a big part of Joseph's life, selling him into slavery, putting him into harm's way. God meant it for good. And then he says that we have to remember to forgive ourselves too. I know sometimes I get myself into messes and then I find myself talking brutally about myself. How could you do this? You know better than this. You shouldn't be doing that. And in the end, we have to offer ourselves that same grace we're going to offer everybody else and that God is offering us as well. So my challenge to you is can you think of a really big hurt you have right now that needs forgiving, that has gone on too long in your soul and in your being? And even if you can't have reconciliation, can we at least take the first small step in actual forgiveness? And next week, we're going to talk about how we know and how can we forgive something. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always tell someone about the podcast. If you ever want me to speak on a Zoom meeting to a Bible study or talk to any group of people, happy to do that too. And you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. You can also find me on Twitter. And the links are in the show notes. And remember, our steps towards forgiving other people starts with small steps. Small steps.